Good morning. I'm Randy Bandman, and on behalf of the Entertainment Law Section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, welcome you to our specially set program, Beyond the Fine Print, the new WGA deal, Unpacked and Analyzed. After a historic 148-day strike that has crippled Hollywood, we are here today with our esteemed colleague, Jonathan Handel, who will help us understand what the new WGA agreement says, what the new terms mean, how the deal impacts Hollywood as we know it, and what it means to SAG-AFTRA, who is still on strike and in negotiations. Jonathan is a transactional entertainment and technology attorney at Feig Finkel LLP, and a preeminent expert on the Hollywood unions and guilds. He's written four books on the guilds, has taught courses on the guilds for a dozen years at UCLA, USC, and Southwestern Law Schools, is a records research fellow based on his work on residuals, was a WGA associate counsel and a SAG-AFTRA outside special counsel, represents guild members and producers, has covered the guilds and strikes for 16 years as a journalist for The Hollywood Reporter and now for Peck News, and has appeared in the media as a commentator over 1400 times. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School and of Harvard College with a degree in applied math and computer science. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Randy. I'll be asking Jonathan a series of questions and you can also, you as the audience, can post questions into our live Q&A in the Zoom for me to ask throughout the program, and if time permits at the end, all we ask is that the questions that you um, are going to raise tie to what we're talking about at the time to avoid any confusion. We'll get to as many questions as possible. Um, the, one other housekeeping matter is that the CLE packet is available now, but there have been some recent developments overnight that we will be updating that packet for you. So let's get into this. Before we launch into analysis of the agreement itself, given your in-depth coverage of the strikes, experience in the industry, and unique perspective, both as an entertainment lawyer and a reporter, what are some of your general observations, Jonathan, about why and how this deal was able to get inked after 148 long days? Well, first of all, uh, again, thank you, Randy, and thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar, uh, including Genna, who is operating behind the scenes, making some of the technological magic work here. Um, and regarding housekeeping, we I will try to update that packet uh, later today. So if you have downloaded it, download it again tonight or tomorrow, whatever. Um, the um, answer to your question, uh, uh, and and I also want to pardon me. I also want to thank uh, the audience for the uh, time that you're spending with us and the uh, and the trust that you repose in us to try to bring you uh, some explication of some of the aspects of this deal. And it is a uh, a 94 page memorandum of agreement. So there's a lot packed in there. Um, the reason the deal got done finally is that the CEOs rolled up their sleeves, got hands on and in person. Uh, it was a 148 day strike. The CEOs should have been in the room 150 days ago or more. And then we wouldn't have had this strike uh, or uh, probably the Screen Actors Guild sag after strike. Uh, these were, strikes are, are so unnecessary. And th those of us who are transactional lawyers or agents uh, and are used to doing deals one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, know that the, the way to get a deal done is to get a deal done, to sit there and, and work towards the deal that you know is in the room and that needs to be found. Uh, that it was not what the studio game plan was. The studio game plan was to, to outlast and outweigh uh, both the writers and the actors. But you know the writers showed two, several years ago that they could go two years without agents and actors for their part go months between acting jobs, 50 auditions, and you're lucky if you book a job, that kind of thing. And so the idea that you could starve these people into submission, to be blunt about it, was from the beginning a doomed mission to a dead planet. And that's why we find ourselves where we are and find ourselves with a small window for a SAG deal. But all of that said, 
we do have a writer's deal and um, let's let's move towards it and move towards talking, talking about it. Are the members voting on it right now? Yes, thank you. The, um, the ballots are out, uh, they're due back, or the electronic ballots are out, I should say. Uh, they're due back uh, Monday, I think midday. I don't uh, check the Guild website for the official uh, time. Uh, deadline. Uh, the the deal will pass. It's, you know, out of respect for the process, it's labeled a tentative deal when it's reached, but the negotiating committee of the Writers Guild was unanimous in support of it. The Writers Guild West Board and Writers Guild East Council were unanimous, uh, and the deal will pass in the, you know, almost certainly in the 90s uh, percentile, if not the high 90s. Uh, no organized opposition has emerged, and it only takes 50% for the deal to pass. Can you break down what you point out is the WGA's calculation that the new deal contains $233 million per year of gains for the guild? Well, this was a good stump the stars. And I and I and I I left it in your in your QA so that I could uh, you know have a bit of humility. Uh I can't. Uh I, I, what I can say, in other words, I don't I don't know the breakdown uh, you know, but it's a you know, they're saying 233 million or roughly, I guess uh 700 million uh, over the three year term. What I can tell you that's interesting and important and will, and will be important in the very first point that we talk about of the deal, so our next uh, conversational point here, is that on the order, well, I can tell you the SAG deal, the SAG offer, which the last studio offer, the studio is valued at, at a billion dollars, um, which comes out to 30 million per company per year. It's not as impressive when you actually look at the real impact, but um, 85% of that offer, that was a 5% uh, wage gain, uh, initial wage gain in the first year uh, that they're offering, uh, same as what the writers got and the directors got. 85% of that SAG deal, of the value of the SAG deal, or to put it another way, of the cost to the studios of the SAG deal, 85% of it is the basic wage increase. It's a stunning figure. Now, I haven't run the calculation with the writers deal, but it would be very similar, it'd be 80, 85%, whatever exactly it might be. Um, and, the, the, and again, that's at a 5% wage increase. So as much as we get uh, distracted and attracted by the bright, shiny objects in negotiation, which is people know, I think everyone knows at this point, AI, you know, and everyone who's a knowledge worker in the, in the country or the world maybe is afraid of being displaced now by AI. And uh, to a lesser extent, another shiny, pardon me, another shiny object uh, here has been residuals, which are sort of, for those who are mathematically inclined, are endlessly fascinating. They're unique to entertainment. They're checks that you get in perpetuity. People, some people live on residuals. You know, it's an like, interesting set of issues. But the bread and butter of basic wage increases, just dollars and percentages, uh, actually is the largest part of the cost of the deal. So that's what I can say with regard to the writer's and that probably gives us a transition into the next question. So let's now turn to the actual document. Um, I believe you alluded to this a little bit in your answer, but this new 2023 memorandum of agreement amends the 2020 minimum basic agreement or MBA and turns it into the 2023 MBA. This current document is very complex and is a dense legal document. As you mentioned, 94 pages in length, and includes interconnected appendices, exhibits, schedules, and side letters. And we were very fortunate to have you, Jonathan, here with us today, in that you have analyzed all of these documents in detail, um, including prior and interrelated ones. And um, based on your analysis, um, you have published a two-part article entitled, The WGA Deal, Ten Commandments. And we're gonna use your articles as a roadmap for our discussion about the deal. By the way, for our audience, you can read Jonathan's columns for Puck News, including this one on Puck.News. So let's begin with your first point, which you refer to as, quote, minimum writers gave to get more. You touched upon this a little bit, but can you go into a little bit more detail about what you meant by this point? Sure. So again, on minimums, the writers gave to get more. They, uh, 5%. Uh, in the first year, and I think it's four and then three, I think three and a half in the third year, second and third year. Um, the 5% is both historically high and historically low. It's historically high in that for the last 25 years, the initial 
uh, the wage increases have ranged from one and a half percent to two and a half percent, maybe a three every now and then uh, uh, in magnitude. And so five, you the studio say, look, this is very high. This is historically high. Well, it is, but it's also historically low because the last several years we had seven percent, six and a half percent, and most recently uh, on the order of five percent, four and a half percent or something inflation. And at the time of the seven and six and a half percent, the Writers Guild Agreement, the 2020 uh, agreement that's now being amended, provided for increases that were on the order of one, one and a half percent, if I remember correctly. I don't I don't even think they reached two percent. Um, so these, this, these were not increases in real dollar terms, whereas in the past, uh, 25 years or so of inflation, and perhaps before that as well, um, the writers as well as the actors and directors typically would get a point to a point and a half above the prevailing inflation level. But inflation, because of COVID, shot up so quickly that the negotiations in 2020, you know, didn't uh, didn't anticipate what we were going to be looking at and what a you know disaster the uh, inflation was going to be for particularly for several years. So the writers, the and the directors, who of course did a deal some months ago without a strike. They, the, the, the thinking in both camps was we are not going to push for an inflation compensating increase. Uh, instead, we are going to use our negotiating capital to get other things. In the case of the directors, uh, they got uh, certain gains in residuals that we will talk about because the writers got those gains as well. They got some, some addressing of AI. The writers got more. We'll talk about that as well in over the next hour. Um, but the writers were very focused. They're they're like, yeah, we're going on strike, but we are going to focus on these issues. That again, if we had, their feeling was, if we had asked for more than five percent, given how uh, overweight the basic wage increase is, even at five percent, uh, in terms of the value of the package, even at three percent, it, it's it's just the heftiest part of the package. Um, they felt that it would be more achievable, I think, to uh, to focus on other on other gains. Now, SAG-AFTRA uh, is not taking that approach. Uh, SAG-AFTRA, uh, unless they've altered their strategy in the past uh, couple of days of negotiation, they are they were in negotiation yesterday, Monday. They're going to be back Friday, and then next Monday, they're going to work over the weekend. They issued a joint press release saying this very reassuring, very productive uh, uh, tone that we're hearing out of the room uh, from, from SAG-AFTRA. And, and also, interestingly, that the negotiations are being conducted at SAG-AFTRA headquarters rather than at the AMPTP for the last several sessions. That's a sign of respect uh, that the AMPTP seldom offers the actors or the writers, quite frankly. Um, so SAG-AFTRA is saying, look, they they went in. Their initial ask was fifteen. Uh, the bid ask now is eleven versus five. They they went down to eleven, but they said they've said quite explicitly. Uh, Duncan Crabtree Ireland, the chief negotiator and national executive director, that we are not going to do a deal where our members make less in real dollar terms three years from now than they made three years ago. I think notwithstanding some press reports that residuals are proving to be a sticking point, and they they are definitely a sticking point for SAG after we'll get to that too. Um, that uh the basic wage increase issue uh is is a very difficult one. Number one, because it's such a hefty part of the package. And number two, there are three contracts, two of them make quite major and in this potentially industry shattering that come up for expiration in the middle of next year that will be taking signals from whatever SAG gets on basic wages and also on AI to some extent. Those three contracts are the, first of all, the SAG after net code, network code referred to as net code that governs talk shows, reality, game shows and so forth. Uh, and then even more critically, the, uh, the master IATSE contract, the crew agreement for the Western United States and the Teamsters Local 399 uh, truck drivers who haul the equipment that you need to shoot movies and TV in LA and uh, certain other Western areas. Uh, 
they're going to look for, you know, if SAG gets, you know, X percent, I'm not going to jinx it by or prejudge it by giving a number, but if they get X percent that's less than 11, but more than five, uh, those unions are going to want at least X percent uh, for their for the first year, their basic wage increase, because they too uh, suffered from inflation with uh, anemic uh, wage increases several years in the last several years. So again, if, if either of those unions struck, uh, they could shut down the industry in an instant, certainly the Western, the Western states. And so we're looking at a very potentially fraught SAG negotiation over this very basic issue. Maybe this is a good point for you to explain to our audience what pattern bargaining is. I believe you mentioned that in your article. Thank you. Um, so pattern bargaining, um, it's a concept that works differently in different industries. Um, uh, I'll mention the UAW for a minute because that's on a lot of people's minds since they're on strike. The UAW, usually, usually what auto workers would do is that multiple unions would negotiate first with the weakest automaker, which was always Chrysler, now Stellantis, and uh, then seek to, whatever gains they got, seek to impose that as a pattern working up the chain to Ford and GM. Um, as you know, UAW is now on strike against all three auto, major automakers simultaneously. They're, doing, they're taking a different strategy this year. In Hollywood, pattern bargaining in many ways works as the reverse. The unions don't negotiate jointly. Uh, the only time they ever have, to my knowledge, was in the return to work agreements that were done to modify multiple collective bargaining agreements at once to make uh, the sets uh, somewhat COVID safe. Uh, and they did negotiate jointly, but they negotiate. The, what, it, what it is, is the first union to negotiate, which is in the last 25 years has almost always, but not always been the DGA. Um, whatever they achieve in certain items that are applicable to the other unions as well, uh, typically become pattern and the other unions end up getting pretty much exactly the same thing as the DGA. Now, a couple of caveats. The two items that were typically pattern were basic wage increases. What percent will, you know, they have different wage scales for the different three different above the line unions, uh, as well as for the below line, you know, for the IA. But the percentage increase increases in years one, two, and three were often pattern. That's no really no longer true. Uh, that started to decay over the last several triennial cycles. But residuals, the above the line unions all get residuals, as most of you know, and the IA under some circumstances gets residuals, not for the members, but for the pension and health plan. Um, whatever the DGA achieved, there would sometimes be some extra gets that the DGA got little, you know, everything about residuals is like a rule subject to an exception, subject to a carve out, subject to a footnote, subject to a caveat, and, and then again and again and again. So certain of those carve outs the DGA might get something a little better, but in general, uh, what they get uh, would be, you know, the writers would say, we want something different. Well, they end up with the same thing and the actors, you know, they end up with the same thing. Now, whether that's going to be the case now on success-based performance residuals is open to question, but certain other changes to streaming residuals that the directors made, uh, the writers were quite happy to accept and say after will be quite happy to accept as we'll get to as we move on. Thank you very much. Well, I know residuals is something you know very well, having written books on it. So we look forward to getting to that point more in depth here. Um, the next point on the actual agreement that you talk about in your article goes to writers of feature films, and you characterize it as progress on persistent problems. Can you explain how the new agreement impacts writers of feature films? Yes, um, several different ways. And one of the most important is that, and let me make sure I get the language exactly right. This isn't quoting, this is quoting my article, not from the, um, first of all, there's a lot of pressure on feature writers to do free work. Um, in, uh, in particular, two, twofold. One is, uh, that's not really addressed here, is preparing detailed um, pitch materials when you're up for a job. We want, we 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 want to do the next Spider-Man. We invite 10 in the studio invites, you know, 10 writers in. You don't go in and these days and say, okay, well, my concept is it's Spider-Man on Mars. And, you know, there's a villain that's uh, a green alien and they kind of fight and they do this and that. And, you know, 60 seconds of 
of a pitch and that's it. No, they want to, the studios want to see detailed materials. But what the stu what also happens, whether it's an open assignment, like, you know, there's, there's a studio, you know, luckily hires me for, let's say, or it's a spec script that I have. Um, and I do have a spec script, uh, but we'll, we'll leave that out. Um, I work with a, with a producer and the producer reads my spec or reads my draft. Um, and what they're supposed to do is, you know, send it on to the studio and I'm supposed to get, you know, paid for it if there's a, you know, assuming there's a deal. Um, but the producers often will say, you know, well, why don't we just consider this one a producer's draft? Because I've got some notes for you and we want to be as strong as we can when the studio cre uh, creative execs and, and VPs and whatnot read your draft or read your spec or whatever, uh, because, you know, you only get you know, one chance to make a good first impression and here are some notes. And, you know, I look at the notes, and I'm like, okay, most of these notes are actually really good notes. Uh, they might be pushed back on some of them, but some of them are good notes. So now it's like, should I do a free rewrite and incorporate the notes and have a better product? Or should I say, look, the Writer's Guild doctrine is no free work. We'll send the script in as is. And we can say we have some thoughts for some rewrites. If you, you know, will listen to the studio notes and if they want me to do rewrite, they can pay me for it. Well, to try to address that dilemma to some extent, if the first draft compensation uh, does not exceed twice scale, then the studio now has to guarantee me the first opportunity to rewrite and, of course, pay me at least uh, scale for a rewrite. So that, that is some attempt to address this issue. Now I've gotten, we got feedback at, at Puck uh, when the, my, this article came out that it, that it contends that it doesn't, it's not really going to address it and that there's the problem of producers rewrites and other such things are going to continue. So I, I can't, um, the, the jury's out on that. And uh, I certainly welcome, and by the way, I welcome anyone here uh, who wants to be in touch with me, to get in contact with me, to stay in touch, whatever. Uh, two things to know, jhandel.com, J-H-A-N-D-E-L.com. It's my website. And in the footer at the bottom, there's all my socials and my email. Um, and jhandel.news is my Substack, stack, uh, very occasional, uh, but it's how I keep in touch with people. And so you're welcome to sign up for that. Um, the other, the, the studios did blink and you can you can expect to see uh, this principle of, you know, the rewrite that the studios had resisted strongly. You can expect to see the writers try to build on that in future negotiations. Um, certainly agents and attorneys for overscale writers who, who make more than twice can use this also as leverage and say, look, if our, if our less statured uh, colleagues are getting this guarantee, I've got more stature than the person down the block. My client has more stature. We want, uh, you know, a, a, you know, at least one rewrite. Um, another thing uh, was an accelerated payment schedule. I won't go into detail on that, but um, it, it again addresses a persistent abuse of people not being paid timely. Uh, and this, we're still in features here. And features made for streaming with a budget of 30 million or more uh, receive an extra increase in minimums and residuals. Uh, an increase in minimums beyond that 5% we talked about. Uh, the writers, the, the, the goal here on the Writers Guild part was to diminish, they wanted to eliminate any differential in payment between feature work versus your writing a feature for streaming, which of course is where a lot of features are being done these days, uh, as opposed to theatrical. The writers wanted a principle called script parity, where any script that you write for any platform uh, gets paid you know, if it's a half hour script, here's the minimum period, regardless of platform, a 60 minute, a feature, whatever. They didn't get that, but they got a, a piece in that direction. Um, thank you very much. And I do look forward to reading your spec script, by the way. Thank you. Moving on, uh, point three of your articles talk to Appendix A, where you note that late night got some love. What changed oh. for writers of late night comedy, variety shows, game shows, and other unscripted shows? Well, to start with, Appendix A is the domain of writers that historically haven't gotten much respect. Um, the minimums are lower, the residuals are lower, 
Um, a lot of uh, other terms and conditions of the guild agreement don't apply. Uh, it's, you know, it's an area, these are obviously more thinly scripted than, um, you know, materials uh, or, or uh, program formats than uh, what we think of as scripted dramas and comedies and, and features. But as if the, uh, you know, the anemic minimums and skeletal protections aren't bad enough, um, none of these even apply to shows of this sort that are made for streaming. So people that, you know, as streaming platforms, Netflix in particular started to move, and, and I guess HBO uh, or Max, excuse me, uh, started to move into uh, comedy variety shows, which is kind of guild talk for late night talk shows, um, you know, late night with whoever the late night host is today and John Oliver and those shows of the, that sort. Um, now, uh, the change is that Appendix A minimums uh, and residuals uh, per, I think with some, you know, adaptation uh, do apply in the streaming realm as well. So it was very important in sort of the let's lift all boats and let's, let's no, no right or left behind kind of approach. The question, the interesting strategic question it raises is there's another area that's even bigger that I would describe as thinly scripted, and that's the so-called unscripted realm, reality TV. You know, as we, as most of us know, reality TV actually often uh, is scripted, uh, but you know, obviously not to the degree that a uh, you know that a drama or comedy is. The Writers Guild in the past has sought to cover reality. The studios resist very vigorously because, as, as you know, reality TV is content that they rely on as being strike proof, so that when there is a strike, they have something to put on the air and something, you know, something in addition to stockpiled content for you know for streamers. Um, but, you know, I, and I don't know whether the Writers Guild is, is, is thinking that and planning that, but, you know, you have a guild here that achieved a lot of what it wanted, uh, both in the agency campaign several years ago and now in here, do you think they're going to stand on a treadmill and just sort of trot at a mile and a half an hour? Uh, I don't. So let's keep an eye out in the reality realm, those of you who, for whom that is, uh, important. I understand that's something that SAG is also dealing with as well. Well, so that's right. SAG um, has jurisdiction over hosts of reality. So the, the professional and professionals who appear, um, and I think professional contestants. So if a, if a, you know, celebrity uh, dancing with the stars or something like that, um, but civilians, um, you know, the open cast, non-professional, non, non-pro non civilians in various formats uh that is not union work and i don't i don't anticipate sag pushing for that this round but as the lines start to continue to blur because sag has sag after has pushed uh into the realm of influencers which again is sort of you know you could call it prosumer content right it's user-generated content it's not hollywood prose but it's not you know when someone is an influencer and they're they're making 100k a year or something they're not they're not, they're not just nobody either uh so as the unions in intend to keep up with changing uh you know creation patterns content creation patterns as well as changing content distribution patterns uh that would certainly be something that that sag as well uh would be thinking about Minimum staffing, that's addressed in point four, where you make the observation that writers' rooms are safe for now. What do you mean by that? And how are writers' rooms treated in the New Deal? So starting in 2017, when, when season links started to, uh, to shrink, um, there, you know, writers are hired by the series, but paid by the work available, roughly speaking. It's, it's a complicated dance or interplay between a weekly fee and a per script fee uh and it's it's made even more complicated by protections referred to as span protection s-p-a-n like nancy uh that essentially say that if the writer spends more than 2.4 weeks on a given script that they get uh they get paid if as long as their salary is below a certain level because again there's a ceiling uh they get paid overages um so this this whole question of how does a TV staff writer or TV writer at various levels uh, get paid 
is a is an extremely complicated one. But the thing that was that was one of the things that was going on is that if you're not doing a 22 episode series, you're doing a a 10, an eight, or six, you don't hire as many writers. In some cases, you only hire the showrunner as an auteur who writes all the scripts. And the writers said, look, this is, we want some minimums here, minimum staffing levels. And what they first proposed was a sort of a sliding scale or stair step uh, approach that at, for a 10 episode series would have required eight writers. Now you always ask for more than you expect to get. I mean, eight writers for a 10 episode series is kind of absurd because you know people typically write two scripts, uh, frequently anyways, would write two scripts on a show. Uh, they lowered that ask to seven. Uh, what they ended up getting was the approach that they wanted, although with slightly lower numbers. So if a series is um, has 13 or more episodes, the minimum number of writers to be hired is six, of whom uh, three must be writer, producer, hyphenates, and the other three uh, don't have to be. Um, if for, and that's in uh, that's in uh, uh, post green light rooms. And I guess I should start by saying, the other thing about these mini rooms uh, for streaming series is that rather than the traditional approach of selling a pilot, producing a pilot, and then green lighting, uh, there are pre green light rooms. So with pre green light rooms, if there are three or more writers, at least three have to be writer producers. And if the room is 20 weeks or longer, there have to be uh, at least three writer producers in the first season, potentially more in subsequent seasons, depending on the episode orders. Post green light, um, the minimum is three writers for up to six episode season, five writers for seven to 12, and six writers for 13 or more. In all cases, uh, at least three have to be writer producers. So they're not far off from the demands that the Writers Guild was making. This was a uh, it appears to be a significant get. Now, we're told by, I'm told by one source that in fact, the dollar value of this is not going to be that great. Uh, this is the allegation. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen the calculation. And uh, I'm also not entirely sure that that's the way to judge something that has both an economic impact as this does, but also has an impact on sustainability of careers and on creative, you know, the breadth of one's creative wings. Um, there is uh, instantly a, um, a carve out uh, that if the showrunner when initially hired <clears throat> is hired to write all episodes. So the case of the auteur showrunner uh, that then that is permissible that you don't have to hire, uh, meet these minimums. So it's either one showrunner writing everything or it's these um, these minimums. And that seems to be, I mean, we'll see how the approach plays out in practice. And of course, what, you know, the larger issue people are talking about, well, you know, are these, the, the more gains that unions get, the more costly production becomes, and the more, the more that depresses the level of production. And it may, I mean, there's a trade-off between um, taking care of the members who already are in the industry or those who are working, which is a, a subset of those members, versus having an industry large enough to to accommodate everybody and accommodate more people, uh, it's it's an inevitable uh, trade off. And of course, with the cost of building out streaming series, I mean, we're you know uh, or streaming platforms rather, we are no longer in this era of where you know just spend spend like water, and consumers are no longer are going to find them no longer in that era. Um, uh, reportedly, Netflix is planning to wait, to raise uh, monthly fees in several months, and other platforms will most likely follow uh, through signaling. Uh, so this promise that you could have an infinite library at minimal cost available anytime, anywhere, on any device, uh, and seamlessly and frictionlessly, you know, has turned out to be... Uh, somewhat true and somewhat of a bill of goods, as we know from, from those facts and also the fact that a lot of content is being deplatformed, uh, in part because of the residuals cost of keeping stuff on platform. And I, I wrote a Puck article about that a month or two ago. So that's mini room staffing, um, which takes us to... Um, well, as we were talking about now, being a writer in Hollywood is being impacted by technology and other changes in the industry, as well as this deal brings us to your next point where you talk about that 
um, the career ladder got rebuilt. So right. and, for someone and, wanting to become a writer in Hollywood, how is what's changed? Well, um, so the so the the block heading of that was mini room duration. The career ladder got rebuilt. So the other thing that the writers wanted was when you have these mini rooms, uh, especially pre green light mini rooms. Um, a lot of times the mini room would close before production uh, even starts. And I think that would be true sometimes in post green light mini rooms as well. And the writers would be dismissed except for the, the head writer, the showrunner. Um, the problem with that is twofold. You know, one is less income for the writers than if they were retained. But the other that's even more, even deeper is the career ladder issue, which is if you want to, progress up the ranks uh, and have the skill to be, you know, co-showrunner and, you know, co-EP. And, and if you want to become a showrunner yourself, which means that you need a good spec pilot in, and Bible in your pocket, uh, but you need something else. You need the experience. It, for those of you, I'll just say, for those of you who are not familiar with episodic TV in detail, and I know most, many of you are probably are, but one thing to know is that the writer producer, the head writer, the showrunner has many of the duties that people outside the industry associate with directors, specifically with directors in theatrical and features. So director in features doesn't just stand there on the set and direct the action. Um, and they, they rehearse the actors, but they also hire the department heads, the production designer, the costume designer, uh, the director of photography, the cinematographer, the editors, um, and they set the visual tone for the overall piece. I want this to be moody. I want the uh, period garments to look a little worn. I want the modern garments to look unnaturally fresh, whatever it is. Well, in episodic television, a lot of that, except for the directing on set itself, a lot of that is not done by the director who often is hired on an episode by episode basis, a lot of that is actually done by the showrunner. The showrunner hires the production designer, hires, uh, probably hires the DP for the show, uh, hires the costume designers. Um, you know, when you saw Mad Men, a very stylistic show, right? Set in the initially, initial season set in the 50s and, you know, these dark suits and thin ties and all of this kind of thing, they're always smoking. That was Matt, uh, Matt Wiener. That was the, the showrunner who, had uh, you know choreographed that, not the um, not the director of the you know pilot or any particular episode. So if you want to get the experience to do that as a younger writer, you need to be hired, not just for the writer's room and writing and and writing your two assigned scripts or whatever. You need to have various kinds of interaction with the showrunner and director and cast and certain members of the crew. So for example, these lines aren't, the actor says to the director and the showrunner, these lines aren't working. In fact, this scene isn't working. Like, where is this scene going? This doesn't make any sense. You know, somehow we slip through, it's a bad, so they will come running back to the writer and it's like, you know, whoever, Jonathan. Jonathan, you got you got two hours to rewrite this. We're going to shoot. We'll pick up some other scenes. You got two hours. You got to fix this goddamn problem. You got to do it right now. Now that's extremely stressful. Uh, I would certainly imagine, uh, but also, like many things, are extremely stressful. It's an extremely good learning experience, and you learn how to do that to to do a production rewrite under pressure. You're going to have to be able to do that as you climb the ladder. Um, not only that, the editing room post production. You go, you know, the, the editor says, I'm going to trim this reaction shot a little bit because I want to pick up the pace here. Well, if you are the keeper of the story, which the showrunner often is, of course, but the writer who, who wrote that episode um, may say, you know, Jane, I don't think we should trim that, that reaction shot because that that strange reaction shot where the where that character gives a little stra strained kind of grin, that pays off in season three, episode five, where we see that character do something that you wouldn't expect. And then you're like, oh yeah, that reaction. Oh yeah, they like weren't really grinning at that. They were like, oh my God, I should have realized the clue was right there in, in, in plain sight. You know, that's what 
sophisticated writing it often you know includes is you know things pay off much later and the audience is like oh my god i can't how do they do that it's like magic well you know so you got to be in the editing room so what do they get um for pre green light rooms the minimum staff of three is guaranteed at least 10 weeks of consecutive employment and post green light rooms the guarantee is the lesser of 20 weeks or the duration of the room itself weeks worked in the pre green light room count towards the 20 week guarantee these apply to television and most made for streaming series high budget svod for those of you who know which is basically going to be most uh uh, uh scripted uh streaming series uh and for some shows only some uh single camera series made for premium cable like hbo and again high budget svod at least two writers have to be hired during production for the lesser of 20 weeks or the duration of production optionally though the showrunner can divide either of those two positions up among multiple writers so that each writer is able to work during production time for the script that they wrote so instead of just picking two writers out of the the crew of you know six or whatever it is you can parcel out okay you've got a week here you've got a week here and so forth um this is uh for the writers guild uh and, and then the guild had asked for more they wanted half the minimum staff employed during production and one writer employed through post and all writers employed during post would receive at least weekly minimums um the guild settled for less during production and they got no guarantees regarding post but it nonetheless to me is impressive that they got any of this and again it is a they said they will continue to pursue weekly minimums through arbitration and no doubt the next round of negotiation they'll attempt to expand this structure so that's uh that is the first five of the 10 major takeaways the 10 commandments well that brings us to the next two points which are um i won't say not just your favorite topic but you are a mathematician so we're very interested for you to walk us through this and this goes to residuals again something that uh, you've written novels on you could say uh, perhaps even a script so uh the first point that is point six goes to foreign streaming residuals in which you state that the provision is good but not better than the dga what did you mean by that what's the provision and what's the difference here if well, any. dare I say when you when you when you say that, that I've written novels on residuals, uh, I, it now occurs to me that my next spec should center on a residuals fight. Who else, right? There uh, you go, inspired here today. Inspired here, and of course they'll have to be murder. But uh, there, there is there was no murder here. Um, the the way the foreign so streaming residuals, um, the way they work prior uh as of 2020 so they were established and they weren't established during the last writer's strike last writer's strike to 07 and 08 established minimums and residual certain minimums and established residuals for online content but when the online con and people thought webisodes and things like this and mobisodes um but then you know netflix comes along with this this streaming model and it suddenly looks very different than what people anticipated you know during the strike and so um, House of Cards was produced under a sui generis on its own thing in terms of residuals. And um, 2014, you get the first uh, set of formulas for streaming residuals that was then improved in, in 17 and in 20 and in 23, each of the three year cycles. The way they worked as of 2020 was uh, domestic streaming residual would be, it's easiest to describe the writers and directors, the actors are slightly different uh, there's a residual base, and that's where the actors differ. The rest, they don't really differ. There's a residual base, which is in the uh, contract and varies for half hour versus one hour. You multiply that by a tiering factor, which is a percentage that ranges from, I think the lowest is either 40 or 60%, and the highest is 150%. And there are five different tiers, uh, as of 2020, there were, uh, depending on the size of the platform, the number of domestic subscribers. To be precise so netflix pays 150 percent a smaller platform would pay 60 percent of that residual base but then you multiply by another percentage which is a once a year payment uh that percentage starts at now i think it starts at 40 percent 
uh, that's changed over time, but it starts at 40%. And then the next year it would be like 35 and then 35 again, then 30 and 25 down to a floor uh, once you hit about a dozen years or so. So uh, a year by year payment, declining percentage each year, a percentage that takes account for the, of the number of domestic subs, and then a base factor that your dollar figure that you're applying that to. Uh, the base is what works differently for actors than in, for writers and uh, directors. The foreign residual for systems that that have a foreign affiliate, which is most of them uh, these days, not Hulu, uh, I don't believe, uh, and I think there's one other that doesn't, uh, Peacock, um, but the other systems have foreign affiliates. The foreign residual has evolved over time, but most recently it was that you would take the domestic residual, calculate 35% of that, whichever year we're in, and that's your foreign residual. Now, as the systems have gotten bigger, uh, the action has shifted to foreign and foreign subs are growing, particularly for Netflix and Disney+. Plus. So what the DGA accomplished was, um, was two things. One, they accomplished some miscellaneous improvements in the domestic residual, small improvements. But secondly, they restructured the foreign residual so that instead of it being a percentage of the domestic residual, it was its own calculation. You take the same, um, you take the same base. No, I don't think you take the same. Yeah, I think you take the same base um, in the uh, in the book. Um, you multiply it by a tiering factor that's a different set of tiers. There are four tiers and they depend on how many foreign subs, i.e. not US or Canada subs that the platform has. And then you multiply by the declining percentage year over year. And that's increased uh, as of 2023, that's increased the foreign residual substantially uh, in the, particularly in the early years, the first three years say of a foreign, the residual. Um, the Writers Guild got the, uh, the same formula, uh, and remember, this is where there's an affiliated foreign service. Where there's, where there's an unaffiliated foreign service, there is a residual, but it's, I think, 2%, maybe one, I'm pretty, it's 2% of the license fee, so it works completely differently. Uh, so if a Peacock show gets licensed to whatever in France, 2% of the license fee, 6% uh, for SAG, 2 for the writers, 2 for the directors. Um, the Writers Guild got the same essentially the same miscellaneous increases in domestic res streaming residual, and they got essentially the same foreign streaming residual formula that the DGA uh, got. My, my friends at the DGA would like me to point out that there were a couple of DGA specific, both in the tw as of 2020 and 2023, there's some DGA specific improvements for features with budgets over 13 million and budgets over 30 million, and you know that are feature length, and you have, in some cases you actually have to negotiate the residual with the guild. Uh, they got some uh, pretty strong protections at the higher budget levels that the writers got. The writers this time around got a little piece of some of that, but not as much as the DJ has, and the actors don't have that at all. Uh, I don't think had had that at all, uh, and maybe they're asking for it now for some of that. So that's there again, pattern bargaining, not a complete. Not like looking in a mirror. It's not a complete replication of the pattern, but they got pattern bargaining. Good, but no better than the DGA. And that takes us to. Uh, that takes us to uh, another term that we could really use your understanding on, which is viewer based streaming residual. Can you please explain what the new deal means with respect to viewership numbers? Sure. Uh, and our subhead here to frame things was a foot in the door but will actors agree? The writers, the DGA did not seek, but the Writers Guild and the SAG-AFTRA did seek or are seeking in the case of SAG-AFTRA, an additional residual for a product on streaming. And I'll, I'll be a little more specific about what I mean by product on streaming in a moment. But for product on streaming, they want the formulas that I just described to you but they also want an additional residual uh, because one thing to notice about the formulas that I just described, they depend on the number of subscribers to the platform, but they don't depend on how sex successful the show is. So Wednesday on Netflix pays a certain residual. If Wednesday were on Paramount Plus, it would pay a lower residual because of that tiering factor I described. 
but Wednesday on Netflix pays the same residual as a flop on Netflix, like Tuesday, if there were. Um, there is absolutely no difference. And the only difference is that ultimately Netflix will take Tuesday, they'll, they, they won't make as many seasons, and then they'll take Tuesday off the platform altogether. And then there's no residual owed. The residual is only owed year after year that the thing's on the platform and available. But the residual itself is the same. Now, tradition, residuals in traditional media have an implicit success metric. Many of them are percentages of the license fee or of producers' uh, gross revenue from electronic sell-through or DVD. Um, all of those, of course, are bigger for successful product um, you know, in general. I mean, assuming uh, the license fee issue, assuming that the license fee is, is competently negotiated. Uh, but you can have exceptions. I mean, like I suspect that the suits, the license for suits, may not capture all the value that Netflix is getting out of it because it was a, you know, modest show. Uh, I don't really remember whether it was a modest hit or just a reasonably performing show on in its basic cable incarnation. But on Netflix, it's been in the top ten, uh, and so the license fee there may not capture that. But you know, the owner of the show, producer of the show is if so is taking a haircut and so are the res the profit participants and the residuals participants so our, everyone's kind of in the same boat now um and other residuals they're based on reruns like basic cable shows on basic cable and it reruns you you pay for each run if the show was made for basic cable again shows that are more successful are going to have more reruns and so there's an implicit success metric there as well um in the residuals formula for streaming because of the opacity of the platforms and the, the refusal up until now to give any data to anybody, uh, you know, it was a completely, uh, you know, subscriber-based formula. So the writers, to be a little more specific, the writers wanted um, a success-based bonus for product made for streaming High, again, a high budget SVOD for those of you who are in the guild world, the guild ecosystem, um, that would pay the most successful shows. SAG AFTRA is asking for something a bit broader. So, so in the Writers Guild context, Suits would not get a bonus because Suits was not made for, for streaming, it was moved over. Uh, SAG AFTRA wants a bonusing formula that number one would apply to at least as of the last time they released what they wanted, their ask, they they wanted a bonusing formula that would apply to anything broadcast on streaming, um, that regardless whether it was moved over or not, they wanted it to apply to both hits and non-hits, again, to anything on streaming, uh, although the hits would get more. And most critically and most uh, distressingly for the um, for the studios, they wanted a um, percentage of the platform's gross revenues. Not, in other words, don't count, don't take the original residual and give me an extra bonus of it, which is what the Writers Guild did. We'll get to that in a minute. They they said, you know, if Netflix, um, you know, from its subscribers and its advertising makes X million dollars this quarter, we want two percent of that a number they presumably would have negotiated, accepted negotiating down, but they want a percent of that um, to be distributed among the actors on all the shows with the hit, with the ones on hit shows getting more. And the the interim agreements that uh, sag after has issued are, excuse me, 71 pages. So there's a lot of detail of their, of their demands. They're for independents to sign on to and acquiesce to what the unit is demanding. But on residuals, it's just one sentence, and it's it's really quite, uh, you know, opaque as to the details. What did the writers get? The writers got two things. They got a very limited form of transparency, which is to say that the that viewership data will be shared by the platforms with up to six uh, staffers at the Writers Guild on a non-disclosure agreement, need to know, in confidence basis. The Writers Guild can share publicly only aggregated data uh, that, that cannot point to a particular show, a particular platform, a particular this or that. Um, so that's information. Um, and 
they got a bonus for but for for hit shows only um that are only for made for streaming product and only for hits and the bonus is calculated as 50 percent of the domestic and if applicable foreign residual so the foreign residual counts if there's an affiliated platform so again everyone about hulu and uh and peacock um so whatever the residual calculated out from what we we're talking about a few moments ago you add an additional 50 percent um now what is a hit a hit is a season a series the entire season of a series or an entire made for streaming movie that 20 percent of the platform's domestic subscribers so we only look at the domestic subs, even though the residual gets calculated based on the foreign residual as well, that 20% of the domestic subs watch in its entirety. Now that's like, well, well, what? But it also can be, it's, it's a mathematical formula. It pen, the way it pencils out, it could also be that 40% of the subs each watched half the season or movie or 30% watched whatever fraction, you know, it's got to multiply out to 20% of 100% of the season or movie um now that seems like a high bar the union was given assurances that it was a, that a substantial uh, amount of content makes that cut uh we will see the union will see uh, it'll certainly inform additional asks um one source estimates the cost of the studios will be less than five million per year uh whether that's true or not uh we don't know whether this nonetheless provides enough of a foundation to build towards a larger uh you know bonusing we don't know uh, so there's a lot that'll be that'll be learned um a big question is whether sag after is willing to pivot uh and accept the writers guild approach or are they going to stick you know with the approach that they want that really you know may be a non-starter uh particularly the platform revenue aspect um that takes us to our yeah. next point Yes, on 2.8, high budget AVOD catching up with fast streamers. So what does that mean? Um, you ask. Uh, and by the way, we we will we can go till as late as quarter after, and we probably won't go quite till quarter after. So we um we will finish I, our, our next point after this one is AI. And I know people are anxiously awaiting your thoughts on this, given that you're also right. a technology expert. So <laughs> right. So we will we will definitely okay. we will so look, if you want to move fast through this fast topic. I will move fast through <laughs> I will move fast through number eight, which is fast. Um they call it high budget AVOD, ad supported video on demand. But video on demand is where you know things are not scheduled, where you demand it. Like um, you know, you go to a library and you click on it, and uh high budget SVOD, uh subscription uh video on demand like Netflix, you can watch it whenever you want. And there are no ads if you pay for the uh, tier that is without ads. And even if you pay for the tier that's with ads, it's considered SVOD because you're also paying for a tier. It's not free. Uh, high budget AVOD um, should just mean the exact same thing, except that it's completely free and there are ads. But they're using the term AVOD to include things that are not video on demand specifically FAST. FAST stands for free ad-supported streaming television. And it's services like uh, Freebie, uh, Pluto, and Tubi, T-U-B-I, um, that when you, they appear as an app on your TV, but when you go into them, suddenly you have a whole grid, a schedule grid, not a library that you can access on demand like Netflix, although there's, I guess some also have a library, but the the FAST part is that there's a schedule grid that looks just like an old style cable grid. And it's 9.15. Oh, hell, there was a show that started at nine that I would have liked to watch. Well, too bad, it started at nine. Scheduled television, appointment television, but through an app rather than through a cable system. Um, so that's what FAST is. And FAST is becoming very popular uh, because people are getting tired of paying what, you know, Netflix is so inexpensive. It's only $5.99 a month. Well, no, actually, it's $15.99 a month now, and they're raising it in a couple of months if you want the one without ads. So people are like, I, I can't afford five different streamers. So they started, they're starting to go to fast. So now there's original 
which which was and still is mostly where content that would have been sent in broadcast syndication uh, decades ago or cable syndication a decade and a half ago, uh, now you're seeing that appear on Fast. There's a whole channel, Perry Mason and whatnot. But now there's original programming, original scripted programming being done for Fast, and the guilds wanted minimums and they wanted residuals for that. And that's what they got. And we won't go into the details on that. Um, two, I think, well, one detail, 2%, uh, I think 2% of the license fee for the writers, 2% uh, for the directors, SAG will agree to 6%. Pattern bargaining is always three times as much with a percentage. And that's our fast look at fast. Thank you very much. So now we turn to AI, which is one of the mm -hmm. biggest topics being discussed basically in the world as it um, is impacting every single industry. Um, including Hollywood. And you point out in your article that it deal provision that was um, agreed to here by the WGA is a guardrail, basically holding back the bots for now. Again, what do you mean by that? Well, let's let's start with the framing. Um, a year ago, uh, only one candidate for Writers Guild West board and no candidates for Writers Guild East Council out of 100, I think 150 pages of candidate statements, only one candidate mentioned AI in their candidate statement. And even that was just in passing. What a difference a few months makes. Chat GPT came to the fore and suddenly, you know, we see that the dog can dance and everyone's convinced that it's going to be performing at the New York Ballet next week. Um, I happen to think that the actors have a more immediate risk than the writers do because there already is technology, namely deep fake technology, CGI, VFX technology that can make, you know, that can that, that can do fake outs with voices and appearances. And adding AI to the mix is going to turbocharge that so that it's much more believable and so that it's much more easy for someone who is not a specialist to. I mean, for example, the deep fakes you tend to see the character sits in one place and it's the, the lips have been in the, the, the deep faked, you know, to the to the words, but it's, you know, but imagine, you know, someone moving through space, you know, moving around. Uh imagine an actor being replaced with such a uh, an avatar. Um, uh, two kinds of avatars we're talking about in the case of the actors, by the way. One is uh, a digital replica of the actor, whether a principal performer or a background actor. Uh, and the other is uh, completely synthetic synthespians. So it looks like a person, looks like a really hot guy, looks like whoever, but that guy doesn't actually exist. Um, either way, uh, actor jobs get threatened. And in the first instance, uh, actors control their own skin, their own intellectual property to the extent they consider themselves intellectual property. And the law is, the law on, right of publicity is state law and it's not in a lot of states and it's sketchy and thin and is not elaborated the way copyright is and even the way trademark is. But it's an area of law that now that it becomes possible to reproduce people, not just photographically from, you know, hundred starting in the 1850s or 40s, but to reproduce people in three dimensions, as it were, that area, this area of law may get more, get better developed. Um, let's go back to the writers. So they're concerned, of course, that AI bots are going to write scripts and the studios won't need before writers. You, before you get into that, I had a question about the definition of AI because it's in the deal agreement. And I thought that was interesting. They put that in a collective bargaining room. So they use the terms um, distinction between what is called generative artificial intelligence versus traditional AI. What did you think of them creating these definitions or being used in this document? Well, I don't know. And 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 to elaborate on that for a moment, they in certain of the provisions that we're about to go through, um, certain of them apply to all AI, uh, and they'll say AI or generative AI. So some only apply to generative AI. Honestly, I don't know what the hell they're 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 trying to focus on and what the import of the distinction is going to be because yeah there's lots of 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 types of ai there's ai that can read um uh, um x-rays and mri scans and and cat scans and may one day you know and 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 helps radiologists and may one day put them out of work there's um 
AI that drives driverless cars and that the Teamsters next year are going to be concerned about because it also drives driverless trucks. But the only AI that generates content is generative AI. So why the writers, they define traditional AI. I mean, traditional AI, it's like, a, I worked in like a pre-traditional AI then that was rules-based. So it didn't work with neural networks, which is what all AI, most AI does these days. Different. You could say that you, you are I. You are I, what? You are I, intelligent. You are I, yeah, right. Or oh. G in front of it. Yeah, and by the way, to further confuse things, the IA is concerned about AI as well. That'll that'll give us some good headlines next year. But um, I don't, you know, I don't know. The, the, the generative AI means, so, it means AI that generates content uh, such as images, paintings, drawings, motion pictures, even moving pictures. Uh, and scripts and is distinguished, it is distinguished from sort of lesser generative AI, sort of this like grammar checkers. I mean, a grammar checker will generate or or predictive text, you know, when you're texting on your phone or typing it and it's in Word, Microsoft Word, and it suggests the next few words that you might be thinking of. Uh, and you can just hit the arrow key or whatever to accept those choices. You know, that's that is AI, and it is generating text, but just a couple of little snippets. There, so generative AI means AI that can generate, uh, you know, complete units of content, for want of a better word, and in particular, scripts and stories, uh, and business plans, and all sorts of things. S software code as well. Chat GPT generates, and now Chat. By the way, now Chat GPT talks. If you if you buy the subscription version, uh, and I've heard that it's really kind of a little bizarre. Um, it'll pause and repeat itself to sound more natural if you tell it to sound more natural. Let's talk about what the Writers Guild got and what the loopholes and potential issues are in in what they got. Um, so it, it, the the AI language adds a new Article seventy two uh, to the Guild Agreement, and it's on approximately page I think sixty eight or something of the MOA, which is in the packet that um, again, we are going to uh, revise the packet today. So you won't, you might want to re-download it, you know, tomorrow morning or something. Um, it provides, first of all, so there's several prompts. First of all, it provides that AI is not a writer and therefore that mat written material produced by AI or generative AI, I don't know how driverless car is going to produce anything, but there we are, is not literary material, quote unquote. Literary material is the guild defined term for covered work such as treatments and scripts. So if AI writes a script, it will look like a script. It might bark like a script, but from the writer's guild perspective, it isn't a script. It's not, it's not a covered script. If someone who's not a guild member writes a script, under certain circumstances, that script is treated as foreign to the guild too. Other circumstances and purchases, it, it may be treated, may be sucked up and sucked in and considered guild covered material. Complicated issue in purchases. Um, now, if AI or generative AI rewrites a script that a writer wrote, the rewrite doesn't count because what AI does doesn't count as a script. And therefore, the rewrite does not diminish the writer's credit, which it otherwise could, depending on how much, you know, if a person rewrites another person's script, if they do enough of a rewrite, they get shared credit, or even on, depending on whether it was an original script or not, the original person can be ousted uh, from credit altogether if it wasn't an original script. Secondly, the AI work does not diminish the, the original writer's residuals, because residuals depend on credit in the writer's guild. Credited writers share residuals, uncredited writers, even those credited at the end with a new thing that they have, don't get residuals. And uh, I infer as well that the guild would hold if there were an arbitration that the AI rewriting uh, does not affect contractual bonuses. So if the writer has enough stature that the agent uh, or attorney negotiated a sole credit bonus, for example, uh, so, you know, if you end up getting sole credit, you get an extra hundred thousand dollars, whatever. Um, first of all, th there isn't going to be a shared credit with the AI. So the terms are satisfied and the rewrite isn't considered a rewrite. So the terms should be satisfied. So you should get your, ben your bonus. Now it also, this language also appears to mean that if a script was first written by AI and then a writer is asked to rewrite the script, 
that the rewrite is considered an original script, not a rewrite. And that the writer has to be paid at least the minimum for an original screenplay or teleplay, not the lower minimum for a rewrite. However, this last point that I, that I make that about a script written by AI that a writer rewrites is not entirely clear because unfortunately example one in the contract language mixes and matches from this first prong that we're talking about and from the second prong and muddies the water as to the applicability uh, and as to this point that I just made. Now, the other thing to note is that the guild is protecting minimums. Now, if I'm asked to write an original script, if I have some stature in the industry, I would typically be uh, paid over scale. If scale is around 150 or something like that for an original script, and don't quote me on it, you can look it up. Um, I, you know, well, you know, Jonathan gets 250 and, you know, or 300. I mean, he's not really interested in working for scale. Um, you know, that's, that's the way that works. But if the script was first written by AI, and then they say, Jonathan, we want you to rewrite this. And of course, we'll adhere to the guild agreement. And the guild agreement says I have to be paid at least minimum for an original, not minimum for a rewrite. Then they, they, the studio, what's to stop the studio from saying, and by the way, we're offering 150. We're not going to pay you 50 or whatever the, the rewrite minimum is. That's violate the guild agreement, but we'll pay you 150. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I get 300 for an original script. Yeah, but this isn't really an original script. This was written by the AI and you're rewriting it. It's easier and faster. The other thing that this does, if this if studios are not inhibited or prohibited from using, from doing exactly what I described, and from having AI generate lots of, of scripts with the help of a creative executive prompting and shaping and telling you to revise. So that's good, but make this one, punch this up, make, make this character more interesting, do this, do that. Um, what does it do to the writers? I mean, I had a career, the hypothetical me, uh, you know, writing original screenplays and using the spark of my imagination to come up with stories that mattered to me and mattered to enough people and could be and were persuadable enough to the gatekeepers of different types that I was selling scripts and maybe getting them made. And now what have you, you've turned me into a rewriter for Silicon Valley bots. It's, we're not interested in, in Jonathan's originality anymore, creativity. We, we just turn him in, into a laborer who toils at rewriting what the bots created. So what does it do to the profession? The, what the Writers Guild got protects the profession in that respect, not at all. Second prompt, different scenario, uh, or, or a, an overlapping scenario, I should say. If the studio furnishes a writer with written material produced by generative AI, not by AI in general, but by generative AI, but what other written material, what other kind of AI produces written material? So I, again, what's the import of this distinction? I don't know what it's intended to mean. That has not been previously published or exploited so therefore, if the New Yorker publishes an AI story, a uh, written story, um, this whole provision I'm about to tell you about doesn't apply. So there's another loophole. And it instructs me to use that as the basis for writing a script or a treatment. Several things apply. First of all, the studio has to disclose that the AI, generative AI authorship. Secondly, some provisions that, are, that protect uh, credit and residuals, again, um, the generative AI material is not considered assigned material for purposes of determining and diminishing the writer's, com uh, the writer's compensation. But again, it's protecting scale compensation, the minimums. It's not protecting me from being pressured off my quote or what I typically get or what I would want to ask for and being pressed down to writer's guild scale. It also won't be considered source material for purposes of determining and again, potentially diminishing my credit. Um, and the residuals that I would get. And it won't be the basis for disqualifying me from eligibility for separated rights uh, if I am so eligible. Separated rights, uh, the one sentence description, because in fact, it, it takes, it, it could take a book to describe separated rights. Separated rights, even though you sell the entire copyright of your screenplay or teleplay to the studio, the guild agreement, which takes precedence over the, over the individual agreement, um, unless the individual agreement is above and beyond, like gives the writer more rights, like 
a right of reacquisition or a right to have higher comp compensation or whatever. Um, separated rights clause essentially clause back and reserves for the writer certain rights under copyright, certain kinds of very complicated reacquisition rights, certain kinds of rights with holdbacks to do stage plays, um, certain economic rights, certain other uh, non-economic rights. Um, so very something the guild has you know it's uh, 60 70 years old the guild is always fighting for to expand and and protect and they have but but again this applies to generative these protections which are significant apply to generative ai not ai generally and only if there wasn't the previous exploitation final um next to final point um on ai uh third point here writers are allowed but cannot be required to use generative AI themselves as a tool uh, to generate snippets of script, to generate ideas. Gee, I want to have my two guys, they're falling in love. I want to have them, you know, in some interesting uh, place, chat GPT, figure out some interesting place in LA where there'll be interesting interruptions, not a restaurant. We've already done that. Um, I can only use generative AI with the studio's consent and in accordance with their policies and rules because I want to protect the copyright ability of the generated material which is um, a, an open legal question that's in litigation now. And if I do use uh, generative AI, it, it won't detract from the status of my output as literary material, it doesn't undermine me. Finally, a very significant issue where the parties did not agree, they agreed to disagree and kick the can down the road with each party. I was gonna ask rights. you about that. Wait, that seems like that's a novel provision for this type of a deal agreement. But yeah, you, usually you given it's new technology, these, the first time these terms have been agreed to in this type of a deal, and as it evolves, it allows them to come back to the bargaining table. Well, of course, they always can come back to the bargaining table. That really, I would, I would structure this as saying this was an area where the writers' guild just could not get what they what they needed. This this fourth point that I'm going to make, and the fourth point is this: generative AI systems work by ingesting human generated material, whether it's photographs, um, photographs of you know images of paintings. Um, novels, nonfiction writing, web pages, everything, and scripts. Uh, the reason they can generate a script is that it's read a lot of scripts or you know ingested a lot of scripts. Um, should generative AI systems be allowed to read existing and future writers' scripts and potentially enhance its capabilities to the point where it can put writers out of business? Now, this is not exactly a copyright issue because the studios own the copyright to tens of thousands of scripts, the legacy studios do, that they bought over the decades and either turned into movies and TV shows, or in some cases, they were good enough to buy, but for whatever reason, they never got made. Regime change, change in taste, whatever, you know, development hell. But they were at least good enough to purchase. So they have all this training, potential training material. Uh, and they own the copyright. So whatever the courts decide on copyright ability and, and, whether, and whether what ChatGPT itself has done is an infringement of existing people's copyrights, the studios wouldn't be infringing their own copyrights to read scripts that they each own. Um, should the MBA, the Guild Agreement, prohibit that? The Guild or, or require consent? Not clear which position the Guild is, it would be pushing towards. Flat prohibition or consent requirement that then would... would would imply compensation uh, or a flat consent requirement. You're automatically deemed to have given consent if you sold the copyright, but you have to be paid a statutory rate, all sorts of solutions, none of which are implemented here. Instead, the studios reserve the right to train and the guild reserves the right to contend that this violates law or the existing MBA, uh, which would probably be a, a stretch. And this means that Scripts can be used to train better and better bots that uh, may one day be good enough to put, you know, some writers um, out of work or who knows what exactly. Uh, it's a potentially dystopian world. We don't know. And so, you know, how much has the AI provision protected the writers? We don't know. Now, our last point um, was everything else. Number 10 small victories and a concession or two. Um, I will just list a few of these. There's no, nothing that we need to discuss. We, we are uh, just about out of time unless there's one or two questions that we should answer. But um, numerous smaller gains, 
one or two minor gives, no real rollbacks. Um, so residual bases for, for network and cable increase, um, pension and health contributions for writing teams went up significantly. Television staff writers have to be paid for their scripts, a script fee, as well as their weekly fees. Higher weekly minimums are established for writer, producers, and story editors. Span protection, uh, which I believe I talked about, now applies to uh, somewhat more series. Uh, certain grandfathering and high-budget SVOD that allowed some series to pay residuals under an older iteration of the agreement. That's now eliminated, lower, lower previous rates. The minor gives an additional promotional run for network television programs and a 3% increase to the thresholds after which additional foreign residuals are due for network and similar content. And of course, the pain of five months of the strike. Um, did we have any questions from the audience that, uh, that seemed compelling to? I, I actually think we covered most of them. Um, okay. A couple of that, um, as Jonathan mentioned, please feel, re feel free to reach out to us after the program if there's some other questions you'd like to follow up on. Um, I know there certainly is a lot to digest here and we could continue talking um, for quite a bit of time. I wanted just to end with what you thought overall, again, standing back from the deal as we enter into this week of SAG entering into negotiations, um, maybe it's in terms of pattern bargaining or not, but how you feel the WGA deal is now impacting the SAG after negotiations in play. I think this is an example of a stair-step pattern. I think the DJ got a good deal, a solid deal. Uh, I think the Writers Guild got a very strong deal. Uh, they built on on what the DGA got, as you now know in some detail, but got significant things the DJ didn't. I think sag aftra is trying to do the same. Um, both factions of sag aftra one that is more oriented towards striking and the other that historically have not been, uh, have been unified for the last year that sag aftra was going to strike. Um, the leadership uh, and they ran a unity slate, in fact, this uh, this time around, their, their current elections. The leadership needs to deliver an extraordinarily strong deal. Uh, there's a lot of pressure for that. The studios are, in, are under a lot of pressure to get actors back to promote the fall shows and to potentially, um, excuse me, potentially on the network side, do mid-season broadcast replacements. So this is going to be very hard, excuse me, very hard fought. Um, but I would be surprised if the SAG deal doesn't build on the writer's deal and go beyond it, just as the writers did with the directors. But we shall see. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, I would like to thank Jonathan for taking the time to explain to us all what the new WGA deal says, how it impacts Hollywood as we know it, and what this all means for SAG AFTRA going back to the table. Um, hopefully, we will back be back here with you all explaining the new SAG after deal on a positive so we'll end on that positive note and hopefully soon hopefully soon thank you everybody and thank you Randy and Jenna <laughs>